Well, uh, as far as my early influences go, um, you know, the first music that I really loved was rock and roll, you know, which I started listening to when I was about 12 years old in the summer of 1965, you know. I, I started listening to these top 40 stations, which at that time, it was just the greatest time for rock and roll and soul music and everything, you know, and uh, um, my fav my first, the first record I bought I, was Willie Bully by <laughs> Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, you know, and uh, I was real into like the animals, the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds, them, uh, Question Mark and the Mysterians, and also um, what they call Blue-Eyed Soul, like the Young Rascals, Mitch Ryder. Later, I got into, when I was in high school, I got into uh, jazz, and I started listening to people like, um, well, if I started with John Coltrane, The Love Supreme was my first jazz record, and then I started listening to like Albert Eiler, um, Cecil Taylor, Thelonious Monk, because my first instrument was actually the piano, uh, which I started playing when I was seven. I didn't pick up the sax till I was about 19 or 20. Sort of did by myself, because I wasn't in any bands, like when I, even when I was in high school, I just was playing piano by myself, and I sort of developed a style of sort of a cross between Thelonious Monk and Cecil Taylor. And um, then uh, after I graduated, I started going to a music conservatory that was teaching jazz. But um, unfortunately, they were very conservative and uh, they could not relate to my piano playing. You know, as far as being part of the rhythm section, you know, they wanted me to play like the normal type chords and I just didn't want to play that way. So it was a big conflict. So uh, that was one reason I started to play the sax so I didn't have to worry about like uh, playing these chords, you know. Uh, but. Uh, but my first big influences on the sax were Albert was, the biggest one was Albert Eiler and also like Marshall Allen and the other uh, sax players in Sun Ra uh, and a guy named Charles Tyler who was sort of a, like a Ch I, Albert, who played was in Albert Eiler's band, sort of like a Eiler uh, on the alto. Um, and as far as the first band, I, that was probably uh, the, the, it was my band. It was a. I started uh, a free jazz group uh, with other people who were uh, going to this conservatory, it was, and it was the first free jazz group in the town where I lived. And this was like 1972 uh, uh, or three. So you can see how conservative, conservative it was there. That no one had even played free jazz there before that. Uh, and then I was in a band, also I was in a rock band uh, called Death. Uh, There's some friends of mine started that um, was very influenced by the Stooges and Velvet Underground. Uh, and, but, and it was a great band, but unfortunately, this, like I said, it was like 1973 in, uh, the mid, in this place called Milwaukee and no one, no one got it at all. They just, uh, they, they, it was just total. We just we, we had nowhere we could play, you know. Uh, if, if, it had, if it had been like five years later, uh, uh, it would have been different. Well, that was, you know, when I first came to New York, which was at the beginning of 1976, my, my ambition was to uh, play jazz, you know. I, even though I loved rock and roll and James Brown, and, um, what I wanted to do was be a famous like jazz play, player and composer, you know. But after and, but after trying to do that in New York for a, uh, for a couple of years, I realized that it wasn't going to happen, you know. Or at least it would have been very a very difficult thing, you know, because there was just so much competition, you know. I'd only been playing the sax for three, four years, and you know, all the other people, guys have been playing their whole lives, you know, so, and, and but, but more important, um, my whole style and attitude just didn't fit into jazz, you know, because uh, I loved the music, but I, I did not, the whole, I didn't like the audience, you know, because it was all, mostly old hippies, aging hippies, you know, 
you know, I started hanging out more and more at uh, like Max's Kansas City and CBGB's, which were the two big um, punk or new wave clubs. And um, eventually I decided that, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to come up with something that would appeal to that audience. Uh, so I just thought, well, if I take um, uh, like uh, funk, like James Brown, and start with that, and then put on the top of it like uh, free jazz and also just uh, just noise, like um, like from some of the other no wave bands that I was friends with, you know, that I might have something. The well, no, the, the original no wave bands were the ones on the No New York album, you know, Mars, DNA. Um, Teenage Jesus, which I was in for before the contor I started the Contortions and and the Contortions, uh, and I was friends with all those people. Um, but it wasn't like we sat down and started to s decided to start this thing called No Wave. I mean, the word No Wave was just made up by a by a rock critic, you know. Um, just it was just a combination of from no New York and new wave no wave you know uh, it's just a label um, but we did have a lot of uh, you know a lot of things in common you know just uh, basically that uh, we thought although we liked all the bands like Richard Hale Talking Heads you know all the uh, bands on that scene we you know we thought they were pretty conservative uh, as far as the actual music they were playing and we just wanted to take it a lot farther uh, you know and get rid of the the, um, the basic rock and roll you know simple chord structure which all those bands used um, but the difference between me and the rest of them was that I always wanted to keep it like danceable um, while they had no interest, you know, had, had nothing to do with dancing, their, their music. I run into them every once in a while, people like Lydia Lunch and Arto Lindsay, but, you know, none of, none, I, I'm one of the only ones that still lives in the, I'm, maybe as far as I know, I'm the only one from those four bands uh, that uh, still lives in New York, you know. Uh, Arto lives in, in Rio de Janeiro now, and Lydia, she moves somewhere new every five years or so uh, and I you know I don't really I think I've gone way beyond like no wave you know as far as the music I do now no 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 roommate I was I was not Lydia's boyfriend uh, not to I mean uh, uh, certainly not her husband <laughs> um, I've never I've never been married I've, I've never gotten married ever to anybody Although I think, although my woman, the uh, woman I'm with now, we've been together 20, over over 25 years, but we're not married, you know. So um, I'm not anybody's husband, but uh, uh, I, really we were just room. She was we were just shared an apartment uh, uh, when when she first came to New York and basically just knocked on my door one night and said, uh, you know, I need a place to stay. I got nowhere to go, you know. And we ended up, uh, you know, living together for about six months or a year. But I know there was a moment when I was going to a rehearsal in a cab before we'd even done any gigs when I just, you know, had this realization that we were doing something that was really new. And, but I never, I never had any plan for it to be commercially successful. That was not part of my thinking at all, you know. Well, uh, maybe a little, but I, but I, I just wanted to do something uh, uh, that would be really powerful, you know, that would uh, express all the rage and hatred I felt, you know. Well, now, you know, now I have different bands in different parts of the world, you know. I have, a, I have Les Contorchons, which plays, which backs me up in Europe. We've been playing together about 10 years. Uh, uh, I, I went to Australia early, earlier this year and played with an Australian backup band. Uh, you know, a lot of places I go, I play with a band from there. Um, and, you know, it gets billed as the Contortions because that's the name everybody knows, you know. And in the U.S., what kind of wine of you? 
Sometimes, well, once in a while I do a show with the original band because they're all, except for the George Scott, the bass player who died like in 1980, uh, the rest of them are all still around. But then besides that, I have a, a whole nother band, uh, which are also guys that have been playing with me uh, since the 80s and, or the 90s. And they're very uh, accomplished musicians. They're guys, they're guys that can play um, uh, funk and jazz equally, you know, anything that I want them to play. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, uh, financially, it's, imp it's just not possible to take them, uh, you know, uh, to other countries too often, although I did just do a show in Tokyo with them. Well, I originally wanted to be a writer. When I was in high school, even though I was, you know, I was playing the piano, my, my uh, uh, ambition then was to be a writer. My favorite writers then were like William Burroughs, uh, Naked Lunch, uh, was, you know, the one book that, like, knocked me out the most, you know, which I read when I was, like, 15 or something. And then later, I really, I really got into uh, Jean Genet, especially um, Our Lady of the Flowers. When I had been at college for a, uh, a year, I just, I decided that, uh, that I, just, I just didn't have the experience to really be a writer at that time, you know? I just didn't feel like I had enough to say because I hadn't really experienced enough of life, you know? But in music, that's not so important, you know? I mean, if you, in music you can express your emotions more directly and, it, and you don't have to, um, you know, use words to make ideas and come up with something, you know, because, it, because then I had no, I, uh, no plans of, of, uh, of singing or writing lyrics, you know? Uh, that didn't, I didn't really start doing that till uh, I started writing songs for the contortions. Yeah, but I'd prefer not to talk about that, you know? I think it's a lot of bullshit, all these artists going on and on about politics, you know, I don't, uh, I mean, uh, I, I do make sort of uh, oblique uh, comments about a lot of things in my songs, but uh, I don't, it's not like I write songs about, uh, you know, the burning issues of the day, you know, it's, it's, um, but if you, if you listen to what I'm saying, uh, you, you'll see the way I, I'm too disgusted by politics to even get uh, to vote or anything like that, you know. I mean, that was a whole, that was one of the main things about the whole movement of people uh, in New York at that time was that um, we were just too disgusted by everything. The only thing that we could see that um, uh, was worth doing was like rock and roll, you know, so we just concentrated on that. Actually, uh, we just, I, we, I just taught the band uh, some songs from, from, uh, that I was doing in the early 80s that, uh, uh, that I only recorded on live albums and never did in the studio. Uh, and we're gonna do a, a whole, several of those um, that a lot of people probably haven't heard. Um, and then we have a, a, a Jackie Wilson song called No Pity in, no Pity in the Naked City and uh, some other ones, some stuff from the last couple of albums and a couple of the old, you know, standbys.